Thanks to everyone who has donated to help my friend Jerry with living expenses and with insulin. We're more than halfway to our goal, and you can't imagine how grateful we are to everyone who has donated or shared the link. Thank you very much. Now, we're supposed to feel safer in our home than we are anywhere else in the world. So when that safety is interrupted, there is little else more terrifying. Here are three true scary stories of the discomforts of home. Number one, twins. The worst thing I can never remember happening to me occurred when I was really young. I was 11 years old. I have an identical twin brother named Kevin. We shared a room. Not because we were twins, but because we were the only two boys that my parents had. This is sort of like a reverse babysitter story. This happened when my parents were away. They weren't going to be home until really early the next morning, so our babysitter Jennifer was there to watch us. She was really nice, if not rather intelligent, and Kevin had a big crush on her. Not that the crush went anywhere, of course. So, anyway, the reason I call this a reverse babysitter story is that it was a babysitting story in which nothing at all happened to the babysitter. In fact, until the end of the story, she was completely oblivious to what happened. Kevin and I were up a little late, watching a scary movie and eating a pizza with Jennifer. All of my sisters had already gone to bed. They weren't interested in movies like that. By the time it was way past time for us to go to bed, we were nearly passed out. So Jennifer helped us up and put us to bed. I barely remember any of that, however. I was so tired. It almost seemed like I was watching the movie, and the next moment, I was turning around in bed. And then opened my eyes. My brother Kevin and I slept in twin beds. There was a window in between the two beds. But when I woke up, there was more than a window in between the two beds. The window was open, and there was a man, dressed in black, sitting by Kevin's bed. But he was looking right at me, and in his hand, he had a knife. I was about to scream, but before I did, the guy did two things. He put his finger to his lips, and his knife over by Kevin. He made it very clear that if I was going to scream, that he was going to cut my brother. I really didn't know what to do, but realized I had to be quiet, or my twin brother was going to get hurt. So I lay there, terrified beyond belief, wondering what was going to happen. I don't know how long it was. I don't know why he was waiting there. And there was a light on in the hallway, and we could hear Jennifer talking on the phone in the other room. I could only guess that he was waiting for her to go to bed so we could rob the place. But I really didn't know. The guy's mistake, though, was although he was holding the knife at Kevin, his attention was fully on me. He was watching me intently, making sure I wouldn't make a noise. He didn't notice that my twin brother woke up and saw the knife. My brother immediately moved away from the knife and screamed at the top of his lungs. He fell off the far side of the bed. I heard Jennifer slam down the phone and heard her running towards the room. She opened the door and was face to face with the guy for one moment before he scrambled out the window. He probably figured to cut his losses and leave before someone got the police there. No one was hurt, which was great, but this was still a scary experience. And the guy got away free as far as I know. At least I never came in contact with him again. Number 2. A Strange Night This story happened about a month after my 16th birthday. Before I begin, I should explain the setting I was already in. I live in a rural Minnesota town, 
So we're not bursting with people and have plenty of space. My house was one of three in a little cul-de-sac a mile outside of town, literally over the river and through the woods. It is not an ordinary house. It's rather new and used to be a big party house several years before we moved in. I noticed weird things about it. The crawl space that goes into an attic-like area is usually in the hallway or an attic. Mine was in my bathroom. I don't know if this is common anywhere else, but it sure isn't normal where I live. As if it wasn't creepy enough to think somebody could crawl out of there while I'm on the toilet or in the shower, I started to notice sometimes some insulation would be hanging down and then it would be fixed within a day or two. I would ask my parents if they had been up there, but they said they hadn't, and this royally freaked me out. Plus, there was an old, ugly lightning rod on a circular peak of our house, which makes it look like a castle, hence the house is called the Castle House. And it makes it look creepy, like an old witch's house. Then, a week before my birthday, the old ADT alarm system from the previous owners, which we had disconnected, went off for no reason when I was home alone, in the shower one day. I had raced naked downstairs to check what was going on, but then it just stopped, all by itself. This now brings me to the night in question. My older sister was hosting a beer bust, big party, much alcohol, fundraiser, for her women's softball team, and my parents and older brother were going to it. I was a little nervous about being home alone, even if I wasn't that far from town, but I figured I could bring my Xbox down and play Call of Duty on our new awesome 42-inch plasma screen in the living room on the main floor. They left around 7. And I played for about two hours or so before I got bored and switched to watching a movie. 2012, I believe it was. About a half an hour in, a thundering bang could be heard from the front door. The door was only 30 feet away, but the sound was so loud, I couldn't think about what could possibly have caused it. I'm not exaggerating when I say it sounded like a sledgehammer being thrown against the front door. Needless to say, I was freaking out, and I immediately called my dad, and you know what he told me? Go check outside to see what it was. Well, it was February, and cold, and pitch black out. Besides that even, I've seen enough scary movies to know you never, ever go outside to investigate a strange noise. At least, if you don't want to die. I cautiously checked out the window. Nothing was there. I went back into the kitchen to grab a large butcher knife and put a medium-sized steak knife in my sock in case I needed it. Then I went and locked the door to see better. I dared not go outside, but I did see better. And there was still nobody there, and absolutely no footprints in the snow. Well, I shut the door quickly, locked it, checked and made sure all the other outside doors were shut and locked, and took my dogs and my knives up into my parents' room, which was the master bedroom. Another weird thing about the house was, in this one particular room, there was a deadbolt lock. I always thought this was weird, but thinking back on it now, it made it downright creepy. Either way, I locked the door and brought my dogs onto the queen-sized bed, and turned their TV on. I wasn't really even paying attention to the TV, just using it as background noise. I was laying with my dogs, who would be no help in case of an intruder, because they were yapping and yipping small dogs, who could only alert me of their presence, or a leaf's, or the wind. You get my point. Anyway, then of course... I heard a car door slam shut, and I went out and looked out their window. Now, I must clarify one point. All of our bedrooms are on the second floor of the house, so this was a diagonal aerial view. 
and I saw what looked to be my brother coming up to the front door. The only way I could tell in the darkness was that he was wearing the coat I saw him leave in. To say the least, I was relieved, and I left the butcher knife and raced downstairs and unlocked the door for him. But then my blood ran cold as I stood white as marble and still as a statue, seeing this complete stranger wearing the exact same coat as my brother's, even the exact same size, double XL. He asked if my parents were home. A typical creepy guy question. I was too much in shock to even think of lying, so stupidly I said no. They aren't here right now. Well, the guy just turned and left. Without saying a word, I slammed the door and ran upstairs. My parents came home about a half hour later, and I explained everything to them. They didn't seem as freaked out as I did, of course, but they weren't there. We never did find out who came to the door or what caused a loud bang. But I know one thing. I am never answering the door, or being anywhere but my room again, when I am home alone in that house. Number 3. Haunted House It was the winter of 1979. My mother, father, older sister, and two older brothers were living in an apartment in a medium-sized city in Connecticut. At that time, money was hard to come by, but my father just received a big promotion at his insurance company job, and money troubles seemed to ease over time. Space was cramped in that tiny apartment, and soon my father went to look at houses to move the family to. I would not be born for another two years, so much of this story is based upon the eyewitness accounts of family. January is not a pleasant month to have to move in. That is what happened. My father found an old colonial-style home in a good neighborhood and made an offer on it. My older sister and brothers could not have been happier, as there was a big yard to play in, a big basement to play in, and a large and almost unheard of at the time walk-up finished attic to play in as well. The house was a big improvement over cramped apartment living. After a few weeks of settling in, it's when strange things started to happen. One evening, after midnight or 1 a.m., my father woke to the sound of footsteps coming up and down the staircase from the living room to the second floor where the bedrooms were. He explained it away as being my older sister, who was 12 at the time. She was probably exploring, as she was a bit of a night owl. He quickly went back to sleep. Soon after, my mother woke to the sound of footsteps pacing the hallway outside the bedrooms. They would stop at each door, then continue on. She thought that was odd, but sleep overtook her again. The next night, the same thing happened. My father awoke to the sound of footsteps ascending the staircase. He knew what the creaky steps sounded like, and he knew that the sound he was hearing had to be someone on the stairs. He fell asleep, and my mother awoke to the sound of footsteps again, pacing up and down the hallway. This time, however, she did not fall back asleep, but looked over to the bedroom door, which they always left open for heat to circulate better through, as the old house was drafty, and what she saw next made her frozen with fear. A figure of a woman dressed in blue was standing in the bedroom doorway. A cold sweat enveloped my mother, and the figure then spoke. It said, Do you know where Margaret is? Well, as you could imagine, my mother, being as frightened as she was, was in no shape to answer. All she remembers is the figure disappearing, and then she fell asleep. My family is Catholic, so the idea of spirits is not out of the question. However, my grandfather was a tough, hard-nosed Polish man who was not really into what he called nonsense. My mother told him what had happened, and he told her point-blank, You are full of crap. Well, remember this for later, as a skeptic will be turned into a believer. My mother didn't see the ghost again, but her presence was sure felt. Shades would fly up on their own. Pictures would fly off the walls. 
and music could be heard playing in the attic storage room where there was no radio. One night, my sister was taking a shower, and she laid a towel for her hair out on the chair in her room. I will mention that she was home alone at this time. After her shower, she went to her room for the towel, and the towel was missing. She looked all over for it and had to grab a new one from the closet. That towel was never found. Strange things like bumps on walls, footsteps, and missing items occurred regularly. But let's flash forward to September of 1981, the year and month I was born. My father and mother were headed to the hospital to have me, and my grandfather and grandmother were staying at our house to watch the kids. But that night, my skeptic grandfather was asleep on the couch in the living room when he woke up to the sound that he described as the sound a dress makes when it sways back and forth. He then saw a woman in blue move across the living room and up the stairs. He darted up to check on the kids upstairs as he thought someone had come into the house, but no one could be found. A few days later, my grandpa said to my mother, I believe you now. That is all he said to her besides telling his story, and he never spoke of it again. We went on to live in that house until I was 17 years old. I never saw the woman in blue, who we nicknamed Margaret, but again her presence was felt. Cold spots, the feeling of being watched, and things darting around corners and upstairs that you can only see out of the corner of your eye. With all that happening, though, we never felt threatened. Sure, it was unsettling at times, and downright creepy as well, but we developed a symbiotic relationship with the ghost. When we felt especially creeped out, we would say out loud, We know you are here, and we are fine with that, but please don't frighten us too much. And that was enough to keep things settled for the most part. Now, I guess the story was not too scary, but honestly we loved that house. We had so many great family moments there, and I only have fond memories of the house. I guess not all ghosts are bad or out to harm us in any way. Hey all, Killer Orange Cat here. We have moved past the halfway point to the goal on the GoFundMe campaign. Thank you to everyone who has donated or shared the link on social media. At the recording of this video, we have raised $803. I appreciate that so much, and Jerry does as well. We will at least have enough to cover living expenses and insulin for June, and that makes us both very happy that it's much more than we had a month ago. Thank you. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Killer Orange Cat, please consider hitting the subscribe button below, or use the icon of Ichigo that will appear at the end of this closing. Feel free to leave some comments to let me know what you think of the video, and consider sharing it with someone you think might enjoy it. You can always follow me and Ichigo on Facebook and Twitter. If you have a story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. I hope you all are having a great weekend, and please don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed, because you never know where a killer orange cat might be hiding. Good night.